So, our second roundtable of today is going to explore the relevance of the international monetary and financial system in reinforcing uh, structural constraints upon uh, the global south in particular. I can't hear anything. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I need to unmute myself. <laughs> Apologies, <Thank> Avinash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Classic error there. Uh. Um, so yeah, so sorry Avinash, to start again, um, our second discussion of today is going to explore the relevance of the international monetary and financial system in reinforcing um, structural inequalities globally. We touched on a lot of these issues in the first session, so this will be an opportunity to, to deepen them and go even, in, um, even more in depth from the perspective of the particular international financial architecture. Uh, these issues have been rather widely explored in academic circles, including by lots of people in this room, um, under the, the recent conceptualisation of international financial subordination. However, as we discussed in the previous session, um, in global policy forums, and in particular within Global North-dominated sustainable finance policy discourses, uh, these, these debates are rather absent, and in fact private finance is positioned as the, the one and only solution to the green transition without, with little if any mention of, of how um, yeah, the international financial architecture might actually exacerbate uh, structural power imbalances. So um, the session now is, aims to tackle these issues head on. Um, first of all, we're going to examine what exactly the role of the international monetary and financial system is in reproducing global inequality, neocolonialism and green extractivism. And then we'll explore how international institutions could be reformed to address this issue. And in particular, what the, is there a, a possible appropriate role for financial instruments, financial innovations? I think that's a quite a hot topic, quite controversial, one where we can get into a bit of a debate um, in groups as well as with our speakers. And so, to start off, to give some introductory remarks, our four speakers today have got a rich uh, depth and breadth of experiences to share on this topic. First of all, we have Professor Avinash Persaud joining us online, who is Emeritus Professor of Gresham College in the UK, Special Advisor on Climate to the Inter-American Development Bank, IDB, and Special Climate Envoy to the Prime Minister of Barbados, where he has been instrumental in advocating for the role of finance in climate protection. So welcome, Avinash. Then we have Dr. Bassani Goyoli, who is Programme Co-Director and Development Economist at the Institute for Economic Justice in South Africa. Uh, Bassani has worked on industrial policy at the Centre for Competition, Regulation and Economic Development and Corporate Strategy and Industrial Development Unit. Uh, she's also the former Inequality Programme Lead at Oxfam South Africa and the former Director of Industrial Policy at the Department of Trade and Industry. So welcome. Uh, then we have Dr. Fadil Kaboub, who is Associate Professor of Economics at Denison University and President of the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity currently based in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, where he's working on climate finance and development policies in Africa. He's also a member of the independent expert group on just transition and development, and an expert group member within the International Ta Tax Task Force, amongst many other posts. And last but not least, we have Dr. Richard Kozel wright who currently serves as the Director of the Division on Globalisation and Development Strategies at the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> Recently retired. Recently retired. <laughs> uh, he's previously also worked at the UN in both New York and Geneva, and has co-written and co-edited a number of books, uh, such as The Resistible Rise of Market Fundamentalism with Paul Raymond. So welcome to you all. And uh, to start us off with our opening remarks today, I'm going to hand over to Avinash. Over to you. Thank you very much, Katie. It's a, it's a shame I'm not able to uh, join you uh, and this wonderful panel, um, who I know well, many of you, and I know the work uh, uh, and admire the work that you've been doing. Um, let me be very brief and, and, and focused. We all know the international financial system is dysfunctional. It uh, is a broken system. It's a system characterized by three things. Firstly, uh, feast and famine. We either get too much capital, which doesn't happen often, or far too little, which happens too often. Or we have a system that's driven by <laughs> systemic risk and fear. So a country may be doing good things, 
But that can get overwhelmed by the fact that another country is in a problem, the global environment is, uh, has lost uh, risk appetite, liquidity retreats from the entire sector, uh, and they also fall foul of that liquidity. <laughs> so good, good behavior is unrewarded in the international financial system. And fundamentally, uh, we see very little flow uh, going from developed to developing countries, far too little. This characteristic has, has been here for a while, uh, even through the period of, of development imperative. Many academics and others have raised the issue. It's come back into the focus now that we uh, that now that now that we have the climate imperative, and now that we need uh, those developing countries for whom capital does not flow to play a major role in the energy transition, and they can't do so from domestic savings alone. Uh, so we will need to, to fix this international system. Some people believe it's about prejudice and discrimination, and, and there's an element of that. There's no question uh, about that. But I think that that would miss a fundamental, inherent asymmetry to the international financial system. And the way I can best describe that is to say that in the domestic financial system, we run the system where there are things called uh, things de defined as safe assets and thing de things defined as risky assets. Uh, and the government does the definition and they define their own bonds as safe assets. And the financial system works on the basis that you need a certain amount of safety, a proportion of safety as we extend the risky uh, lending. The international financial system is the same. We have defined, whether it's through Basel banking regulation, uh, uh, international uh, savings and pension and insurance regulation, whether it is through credit rating agency norms, uh, a similar world of safety and risk. And developing countries, they produce risky assets. Developed countries produce the safe assets. So you have an interesting situation in development where developing countries have to import safety and they're the exporters of risk. Uh, that makes the system very asymmetrical. It causes the beast of famine. It causes the systemic risks to overpower local behavior. How do we solve that? I think we can do it. I think we can, uh, I think the design of special drawing rights uh, was, was it, was, a, was deliberately an attempt to make the system more symmetrical and less, less asymmetrical. Uh, we, uh, through the COVID issuance of 650 billion uh, SDRs, show that this is possible to do so. We need more SDRs. Uh, we need a climate issuance of 650 billion SDRs. Uh, but in addition to that, I think we need a system, and my final point would be this, we need a, a system where we build in automatic issuance of SDRs when the global system needs it. We can have independent measures of financial stress, and whenever they reach a particular tipping point, we have an automatic issuance of SDRs. That will create a system uh, that is more symmetrical, calmer, and will allow greater flow of finance. Less feast, less famine. Uh, a more sustainable long-term finance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Avash. There's some really thought-provoking opening remarks. I'm going to hand over now to uh, Bassani. Okay. Next. Um, thank you. So I'm basically going to talk about how the, the contribution that we are making uh, at the IEJ uh, on debates uh, and advocacy around reforming uh, the international financial architecture um, and how we've done that work in collaboration with uh, uh, other civil society organizations and trade unions uh, through this, the development of a rights-based uh, climate finance toolkit uh, which is basically targeted for climate justice uh, campaigners within that space. And we saw the necessity to, to do this work um, 
uh, because South Africa became the first recipient of the Just Energy Transition Partnership deal, which is a deal between South Africa and a few Global North uh, countries. And what we saw is, um, you know, this was a secretly organized deal that no one really knew much about. And we're still a lot of climate justice activists, uh, you know, the, the, the idea, the idea of development finance and climate finance is relatively quite new. So we kind of needed to um, uh, do a lot of like political education and, and, this is, and this is what this particular toolkit is about. Uh, but it's more than to, uh, about like defining concepts. It's, it's also rather about um, kind of identifying um, particular advocacy points where civil society and, and trade unions can actually um, act, manageable ones. So you won't find, so they won't be like overhauls. <laughs> uh, and others might think that we are tinkering, uh, but I think it's still quite Im Im important work. Um, because the JP is, is basically an application of this problematic billions to trillions agenda, uh, which basically rests the pathway and pace of, of the decarbonization agenda on private finance through the leveraging of, 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 of public finance. Um, so one of the most striking features of this uh, is, is um, the dominance of loans over grants, particularly con concessional loans. And another, uh, you know, you put it so well in your formula here, is where the, where the money is going, right? So a lot of, it's a, it's a big infrastructure project uh, and very much, very little goes to the justice elements uh, um, uh, like economic diversification, innovation, skills development, very little is, is, is targeted towards that. Um, so we, so the toolkit co covers a whole range of issues but I will focus on, on particularly three, right? So much of the financing, uh, as I said, will, will be concessional loans um, that are dispersed by international financial institutions. And this may compromise uh, the principle of independent pro the independent process of national development, as IFI's, IFI loans uh, typically have regressive uh, conditionalities. So one of the areas of focus in, in the toolkit is proposals around uh, the advocacy of establishing domestic legal frameworks mm -hmm. for parliamentary oversight uh, of IFI's lending practices to basically dem democratize decision making over um, IFI loans. And so these would spell out the formal engagement processes, the procedures, the protocols to ensure effective parliamentary uh, input into IFI uh, surveillance uh, processes. And, and very key, it's not enough to just have frameworks, but it's quite important to capacitate um, parliamentarians on, 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 on the surveillance uh, uh, process. So um, part of it is to ensure that there is technic technical capacity, uh, particular no knowledge requirements, and, and the development of procedure for uh, parliamentary uh, engagement engagement, right? And so this is actually a campaign that we are currently doing in South Africa uh, through um, uh, various movements um, uh, uh, and, and we, we basically want to build, right, uh, on, on this. Uh, and, and also the presence of commercial loans and, and, and foreign direct investment as part of this uh, um, uh, JP may also compromise this very principle of uh, independent process of, of, of national development through unreasonable protections offered by bilateral investment treaties and its associated uh, pro-investor uh, international dispute uh, settlement arbitration. So we propose advocacy around um, a complete reform of, of, of that kind of dispute settlement framework and collective support for binding treaty on, on business and human rights. South Africa has repealed its bilateral investment treaties, although there are still some that are in operation. And so you will find that some companies can actually set up shop where they are in operation. So this whole idea of, of, of treaty shopping. 
so as to, oh my gosh, really? Uh, so, sorry, I'm looking at the time. Um, uh, so yeah, anyway, so there's, there's a bit of work that needs to be done um, uh, uh, in that. And then another area is, um, uh, is on uh, 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 technological development and transfer. Um, as you heard, uh, the private finance basically, or, or the, the, J the JetP in specifically, basically says, we, you're, gonna, you're gonna invest in these things that are actually gonna help me, right, um, as the Global North partner. So th this is where issues of economic diversification and technological development and transfer become quite crucial. Uh, and so, um, uh, so we've got, uh, we propose advocacy around uh, reforms that allow for greater flexibility in, in the WTO TRIPS agreement to allow for technological uh, and uh, uh, development and transfer. Um, and there's also uh, uh, proposals that we make around greater uh, <laughs> coherence between UNFCCC provisions and also some uh, WTO agreements. And then similarly, um, because this is a very, so a lot of this talk is around pushing back from what the, the actual JP uh, uh, talks to. And so what happens in times of crisis, uh, and of course the focus here is that there's a, this is a very debt-centric financing uh, uh, regime. Uh, and, um, and so obviously uh, this basically risks, uh, uh, um, there's a risk of financial burden on, on, on developing countries, right, which can sp spur a debt crisis through, more, through, through these types of uh, deals. Um, so th the call for more grants is a key thing and also the call for climate reparations is a, also a very legitimate and key thing uh, that uh, should be pursued vigorously. But another intervention that we look at is um, mm -hmm. reforming the IMF's debt sustainability assessments mm -hmm. which are currently under review. And we argue that these assessments must include human rights and SDGs in, in DSAs because research has shown that the inclusion of SDGs in, in DSAs for about 19 countries that are currently in debt distress will result in debt cancellation and relief. So that is a very key intervention. And this is because the revised DSA metrics will not only take into account what is currently taken into account, which is uh, payments of debt service costs, uh, but also uh, take into account the investments that are required to secure uh, the SDGs. Um, wrap it up. <laughs> I'll just say, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And on to Richard. Oh. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, always nice to come after Abby with very succinct remarks. And I'll try and follow up on that. I'm going to start at the beginning, though. Just a reminder of what the Bretton Woods thought they were doing 80 years ago. And my reference point always for this is the statement by Henry Morgenthau, who was the chair of the Bretton Woods conference, uh, who had to go to the US Senate to defend what they'd agreed to and to explain to the American public why it was a worthy endeavor to endorse and follow. And in do, and it's a very short statement that Morgan, it's worth reading. It basically said the institutions were set up to do three things. They were set up to ensure that the kind of beggar my neighbor policies that had wrecked the global economy in the 1930s were not repeated. And that was the basis of a fixed exchange rate system and, and, and uh, the provision of uh, liquidity for balance of payments problems that it was part of the uh, architecture. So, but that notion of, of the danger of begging, begging my neighbor policies was a central one. They, secondly, he wanted uh, a lot more international public finance to complement the efforts of countries to boost their resource base, for, both for productive investment and for the provision of uh, social services and public services of one kind or another. So a very strong emphasis on international public investment. And last of all, and surprisingly, that 
he wanted uh, these institutions to prevent bullying of, of smaller countries by bigger countries. That, that was important to the Americans for a very brief period of time. Now, we can argue whether these three goals were really ever followed uh, in the workings of the system from the late 1940s, early 1950s onwards. We, would, we have endlessly argued in UNCTAD that, of course, they never really uh, adhered, endeared themselves to that kind of uh, framework. But that was the original intention, I think. And it's important to keep that in mind uh, when discussing the role of, of the multilateral financial institutions, because it's actually a benchmark <laughs> against which to measure their actual uh, practice. Um, of course, we know that, and I, at least we would argue, that the system that evolved particularly after the um, Volcker shock of the late 1970s, early 1980s, was actually a very different system, even from the um, insufficient system that was um, put into place at the end of the Second World War. It was a much stronger focus on essentially market-based finance, finance as the driver of the system, which was part of a, a, a larger shift. Not, it was not just a change in international, in the workings of the international co economy, but it was clearly a change in the nature of the relationship between finance and the real economy that emerges out of the neoliberal uh, revolution, out of the collapse of the, of the Soviet Union, etc. And, and, and that's the, this market-based solution uh, approach to finance is the one that now dominates the climate finance space. Um, and I think, and, and, it's very, and, and at least for us, that's really the source of the problem. It's not that markets won't have a role to play in this, in, 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 in mobilizing resources to deal with the multiple problems that countries face, both of a climate and economic nature. It's the way in which that is, is, is uh, evolving that is the source of the problem. And, and you, I've, we've heard about that already, you're familiar with it. Anyone who read Mark Carney's piece in yesterday's Financial Times on the glorious opportunities of carbon markets will get a sense of what the market-based approach to dealing with these problems is all about. Um, at least for us, and, and what we've tried to insist on, is that the people who push that in these spaces, in, in the COP space, in the G20 space, in the, in the, in the uh, Washington space, have never come to terms with the paradox at the heart of this system, which it is a cheap credit, high profit, low investment regime. And the problems that we need to de deal with are require a large and uh, a significant uh, investment, big, a big push, if you like, of investment into a series of activities uh, that, that are needed to produce the kind of fairer and more sustainable world that we want. Pro uh, resources that, as, as Avinash also said, are particularly scarce, of course, in, in developing countries. And in that context, we, we don't believe that the current organization of the uh, international financial institutions is fit for the purpose of helping countries to mobilize the resources that they need, not only for the climate challenge, because for many developing countries, let's be honest, the climate challenge is a secondary challenge still to the problems of raising living standards and providing basic public goods. Um, and so, but, but even abstracting from that hierarchy, the system is not delivering the resources that, that developing countries need uh, to, to meet the sustainable development goals. And so it's not just about tinkering with this system, it's about offering serious reforms to get the system back to what it was essentially set up to do at the beginning by people like Morgan Thau and Keynes and, 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 and the original designers. Avinash has mentioned one uh, on the role of special drawing rights. I am kind of pleased to, to remind you that UNCTAD was the institution that made sure that special drawing rights was available as a universal liquidity tool and not just one that was available to uh, the main developing countries, which was the original intention of the, of the G10 that, 
that, that designed uh, special drawing rights. But that, that role of, an expanded role for special drawing rights is undoubtedly critical in terms of ensuring that the system can provide um, both increased stability and also uh, more productive resources. The one issue, I'll, I'll just throw two other issues that I think are required if we're going to mobilize the, and, and, and Asad is now telling me we're up to $5 trillion in terms of the target that is needed to, to, to meet the, uh, the climate goals, let alone the uh, Agenda 2030 in its entirety. Um, so we, we need a, a scaling up effort on a significant scale. Um, I think one of the critical issues that UNCTAD has insisted upon always is that we lack, given that we operate in this very debt dependent system, w given what we know about the shocks that developing countries face under current arrangements, mm -hmm. we do need to have a formal set of rules mm -hmm. uh, and practices and arguably an institutional arrangement separate from the Bretton Woods institutions to manage the problem of sovereign debt. Mm -hmm. And, and we've argued consistently for the need for a global debt authority, um, one that is independent of both creditors and debtors, because at the end of the day, the, the negotiation over uh, uh, sovereign debt stress has to deal with both sides of that, of that contract. And, and so you'd need a degree of independence. The IMF and the World Bank are creditor institutions. They, they are... They are inherently biased in one direction. So UNCTAD has always argued the need for some sort of independent uh, institutional structure to manage the problem of sovereign debt. I just don't think developing most developing countries can mobilize the kind of resources they need for climate and development problems without seriously dealing with reducing the debt burden they currently face. I just, it's just not possible given the, the, the servicing constraints they face. So, so putting that up front and centre on a reform agenda, I think, remains critical. And I would argue in that context that credit rating, we need to look again at credit rating agencies. They, 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 have, they have been highly pro-cyclical in the way in which international capital flows, and they have inherent biases in terms of what is considered credit worthy. And I think, I think some kind of effort to, to design a, a, a more independent credit rating system has to be part of some new uh, international architecture that can, can deliver uh, stable resources on the scale that we're talking about. Thank you very much, Richard. Okay, I look forward to delving more into some of those ideas in the discussion. And last but not least, Fada, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the invitation and for hosting this, uh, this important conversation. A lot of my remarks will reflect uh, the work that we've done in this Just Transition report, which there are a few copies on, on the tables in front of you, which was published by the Independent Expert Group on Just Transition and Development, which was convened by Dr. Yuba Sukuna, former uh, vice chair of the IPCC from, from Mali. And uh, I'll start by stating a few key statements from, from this work um, and, and kind of broadening the conversation a little bit beyond just the financial architecture because I believe it's a subcomponent of a larger system. The first thing to say is we can't decarbonize a system that hasn't been structurally and economically decolonized yet. Uh, similarly, we can't de-dollarize a system that hasn't been structurally and economically decolonized yet. And we have quite a few political leaders in the Global South now who want to de-dollarize uh, de the system. The right political uh, motivation, the right sort of intuition, but it's lacking the economics of, of decolonization. Um, so what, what do we mean by that? The financial architecture, first of all, reforming the financial architecture is, is the right intuition, but we're really after transforming the financial architecture. And it's a subcomponent of a global economic architecture that includes the financial architecture, the World Bank, IMF, and so on, that includes the international trade and investment architecture, that's the WTO, one of the, the big blind spots of uh, a lot of these conversations, and the international taxation architecture, which for a long time was in the hands of the OECD countries, and now we have a UN tax convention process 
that is sort of helping move us towards decolonizing international taxation architecture. That entire tax uh, economic architecture framework from a global south perspective was not designed by us, was not designed for us, so why do we expect it to deliver a just transition or to, or to do any of the good things that we, we want to? So unless there is actual structural transformation, and these are institutions and frameworks that were developed during colonial times to impose a particular colonial economic role on the global south. That can be summarized in three major points. We're supposed to be the place for cheap raw materials for the industrialized world. Number two, we're supposed to be the consumers of industrial output in our large consumer markets. And number three, most importantly, we're supposed to be the place where obsolete technologies, assembly line manufacturing that is no longer needed in the industrialized world is outsourced to us under the label of development, cooperation, job creation, all that stuff. But what it does effectively is that it locks you at the bottom of the global value chain. So when we talk about a just transition or transformation or decolonization, we're talking about undoing those three fundamental roles that have been imposed during colonial times and reinforced during post-colonial times under the global economic architecture. And, and that, is, that is the transformation that is, that is needed. And I'll give you one statistic that we can unpack later, and it's a little bit outdated, uh, and some of my colleagues and I are working on updating this, uh, Richard knows, which is if you divide the world into global north and global south and net out all global financial transactions, FDI, exports, imports, remittances, illicit financial flows, the net amount, the last figure we have, is $2 trillion moving from the global south to the global north. $2 trillion, right? When I first paid attention to this number some 20 years ago, it was 500 billion and we thought it was outrageous. And it's accelerating. And that's not a bug in the system, that's the design of extraction of wealth. Now put that number side by side with all the other climate finance numbers that you're familiar with. You know, the $100 billion promised and not delivered, or, or they pretend it's delivered. Now, most of it is non-concessional loans, actually. Side by side with the Green Climate Fund, the last replenishment is $12 billion, right, from last November or October. Side by side with the Loss and Damage Fund, which has $700 million in it. And you will not find a single climate fund on this planet that can match the annual profits of the top five fossil fuel companies. So we're not serious about climate finance. We're not serious about just transition if these are the engines of, of extraction of the system. And when you look at you know, external debt and the limited fiscal policy space that we have in, in, in the global south, you look at external debt and say, this is the problem. And then we have main leaders like you know, President Ruto and others saying, we want more concessional, 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 but don't transform anything because that's, that's unacceptable, right? You look at external debt, it's actually the symptom of deeper structural issues, which we discuss in, in this report, and I'll briefly summarize them. Number one, food deficits. Number two, energy deficits. And number three, manufacturing deficits or industrialization deficits. When I say food deficits, the UNCTAD numbers from a couple years ago, Africa as a continent imports 85% of its food. When less than 100 years ago, we used to be the breadbasket for former uh, colonizing powers. Not by accident, it's by design. It's the agricultural subsidies in the global north imposing a particular agricultural assignment to the global south to become the cash crop producers, right? Energy deficits, and here I, I include our biggest oil exporter in Africa, Nigeria, is energy poor. Nigeria today imports 100% of its gasoline, not by accident. Angola, the second largest, imports 80% of its fuel. This is Classic economic entrapment by fossil fuel companies for global south oil rich countries. And number three, and I'll close with this because I see the, the time check, uh, the kind of industrialization or manufacturing base that we were allowed to have, and I use the term carefully, is the kind where you have to import the machines, import the fuel to power the factories, you have to import the intermediate components to assemble with low cost labor, and we even import the packaging. So we end up with value-added content of exports that's low and value-added of imports that's high. So you can double, triple, quadruple your exports. You're always locked at the bottom of the value chain. So the way out of this, if we're serious about transformation, if we're serious about a just transition, 
then the solutions are right there. And they just so happen to be economic decolonization and transformation solutions. They also happen to be coincidentally climate solutions, because that means strategic investments in food sovereignty and agroecology. It's a win-win on the economic decolonization on the adaptation front. Strategic investments in renewable energy sovereignty, which is Africa's biggest potential. The, the last report from the International Energy Agency is saying by 2040, with existing technology, not new innovations, Africa can produce 1,000 times its energy needs. 1,000 times, to make OPEC look like a joke. Which is why this is perceived as a threat, when it's actually an opportunity for everybody. And then finally, Global South, Pan-African, South-South cooperation on industrial policies. Not at the national level, but at the regional level, where you have the economies of scale, you have the complementarity of resources and capabilities. Not to assemble for other people, but to build the building blocks of development and prosperity, starting with renewable energy infrastructure, with the critical minerals that we actually have in the Global South, clean cooking infrastructure for the billion people on the African continent who need access to clean cooking infrastructure, clean transportation infrastructure to actually build the logistics of the continent, and in here I mean public transportation, not everybody with their Tesla battery. Uh, these are the kinds of policies that will actually allow us to move towards a just transition and reposition the global south away from the bottom of the value chain, away from the traditional colonial role that was imposed on, on the global south. Thank you. remarks there and I think that's going to give us plenty of food for thought for a bit of a debate uh, later on. Um, I just want to turn to uh, some questions direct to our panel now because unfortunately Avinash can only stay with us until uh, 4.30. Um, so what I'll do is I'll ask Avinash a question and then I'll open it up to the floor for anyone who, want, who also wants to ask Avinash a question before he, he jumps off and then I'll continue with my questions to the, to the rest of the panel. Um, so, so Avinash, I'd, lo I'd love you to go in a little bit more detail about your proposals for SDR issuance. Um, in particular, how do you think, uh, S like, how does SDR issuance sit within a broader uh, redistributional ambition, which would include policies such as uh, climate reparations, which we spoke about in the, in the previous session, and also broad-scale debt forgiveness, for example. Um, <laughs> How does SDR issuance help to come, overcome some of the power imbalances that, that we've, we've spoken about so far? And on a more kind of geopolitical, from a more geopolitical angle, you know, why, you know, SDR issuance isn't, isn't a new idea by any means. Why has there been so much resistance to, to pushing forward this idea? And what needs to change to overcome that geopolitically? What kind of coalitions <coughs> need, to, need to push forward to, uh, to advance that proposal? Um, great question. Let me uh, try to frame them a little bit based on what we've just heard from your uh, excellent uh, panelists. Because I, you know, I, I feel that what we've heard is a largely correct critique of the system. But I've spent the last 10 years, better part of a decade, uh, representing a developing country government. And grants are not increasing. We don't have an option of more grants and less debt. We don't have an option of uh, more concessional finance and less private sector. Mm -hmm. We ought to, we should, there's a moral, economic, and investment case, strong economic and investment case, but it's not happening. And I, I guess I, you know, I, I come across this because as a developing country government representative, past, I sat across the table from other government representatives. And if we want the system to change, the people we need to be speaking to is not ourselves, because we all agree around this table. It's the electorate in developed countries. They do not agree. They are not voting to increase aid budgets. They're voting to deport foreigners. They're voting for protection. They're voting to maintain a colonial system, not to dismantle it. We can't even get a British Labour Party government who is committed to going back to 0.7% on GDP of aid. We have a Biden administration, one of the most liberal administrations we've had for a while. Mm -hmm. And what are we seeing change in the system? So I, I don't 
feel, I, I think it's right that people are making this case to the developed country electorate. But don't make the case to developing country governments. We, we accept it, but we just know it's not happening. So what can we rely on? Well, we have a system, we have an interesting system. I think it's actually a rare form of beauty in the system, that at the core of the system are AAA rated development banks. The core of the international financial system are AAA rated development banks. And they could lend twice the amount that they do lend. They've become irrelevant in the current international um, their, their main shareholders seem content with that. But we have to make them a much more central part of the international financial system if we're going to change something. And they can lend twice as much with their existing capital. So no developed country government has to put in more money. They just need to be able to, to, to lend fully on the capital and guarantees and callable capital that they have, including using it. So I think that my first, and I'm focused on what can we deliver for developing country people over the next four or five years. I don't believe we can deliver more grants. I wish we could. I believe we can deliver a development banking system that is three times bigger than what it is. They have already increased on the back of some of the Bridgetown Initiative ideas and the back of the CAF reform ideas. The headroom for developing banks, development banks, has increased by $400 billion in the last two years alone. $400 billion. We've never had that kind of increase over the last 50 years. Now, it should be $2 trillion more, but $400 million is a start. So we need to fully leverage these things. And there are two main things that we need to focus on that can be done without developed country electorates, meaning that they are sending money abroad, uh, and firstly, it is uh, uh, on um, making sure that we're using these callable capital, these guarantees. Currently, they're not really being used because no one really knows how they would be used. There's no clear pattern of how callable, no clear roadmap as to how callable capital will be called. And as a result, people don't count them. So we need a clarity on that. And nothing needs to change with the amount of callable capital. But we need clarity on how it's and secondly, on SDR, so what is the geopolitics of, of why we haven't had greater issuance of SDRs? I think that's a great question. Uh, clearly, there is a geopolitical issue. When have we had SDR issues? We had no issues at all after the first one until the so-called global financial crisis. That was really a North Atlantic financial crisis. The developed countries were involved in the first major international financial crisis in which developed countries got involved. Then suddenly we have a big issuance of SDRs. And then COVID, which engulfed developed countries, we had a big issuance of SDRs. So I think that climate is our lever point, because climate matters to developed countries. And that's why we need a massive issuance of SDRs around climate. But I would say these ad hoc one-off issues uh, misses an opportunity for us to redesign the system and redesign the system with automatic issuance of SDR. So, you know, the, 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 the key point of, about the SDR is that when the global financial crisis, when the global financial system is in crisis and people are leaving one area, developing countries, they're going to another area. There's symmetry in the system, leaving one, going to another. The SDR rebalances that symmetry. So if, if developing countries have SDRs, then these SDRs will grow in value as people are leaving their country and going into the components of the SDR. So that's why the system was designed, that's why SDRs were created, to create symmetry in the system. Uh, and I think that we need to have a, uh, a, a systematic way of issuing more of these whenever the system is under stress and crisis people leaving developing countries. So not just one-off. I think we should begin with a one-off uh, issuance uh, and, and label it around climate. Uh, it should be over $650 billion, at least of that, that amount. Uh, and then $100 billion or more whenever the system is under crisis. So we get a regular issuance of SDRs. SDRs today 
which are essentially a call on other people's central bank reserves, uh, are around 10% of global central bank reserves. We could at least double that. The system will not be uh, get into a problem until we have SDRs, a uh, call on other people's central bank reserves, that are greater than, say, 20 or 25 or even 30%. So we've got a long way to go uh, before we reach a point in which we've fully spent that lever and need to find other levers. Thank you very much. Does anyone else have any questions for Avinash? Have you talked to the US Treasury about this, Abby? <laughs> Well, I think a climate SDR is something that has some legs. I think the idea of, a, of, a, of an automatic um, stabilizing part of the system, there's very little traction for that, but we have to, we have to build that case. Yeah. Oh, Hi, Avinash Masan. Uh, it's very nice to meet you. I've never had the chance to uh, greet you. I mean, the logic that you're using seems very self-defeating because, I mean, if we were to take slavery as an example, if, um, if African people didn't believe in their freedom, they would not have done anything to, to make themselves free. And so what you're suggesting seems, sounds a bit self-defeatist, that we can't change very much, so we must, we must tweak a little bit around the edges. And, and, and so that it makes it possible, in, in other words, to reproduce the system. What you're suggesting is not, in my view, from any sort of sound analysis, is very um, supportive of a very long-term effort to address climate action. I mean, if people believe it is possible to change the system, the Haitian Revolution lasted 12 years. So if you take a quarter of uh, you're talking about four years to, to, to make some kind of tweaks here and there. Um, it is possible for a revolution to happen. I mean, you just have to first not have a self-defeatist attitude and join with other people to make that kind of change possible. Don't you agree? I, I'm afraid I don't. I, I, I'm all full people making that case. Um, I believe, you know, as you get older, you become a believer that there isn't one way. So I power to you to make that case. Uh, but uh, I feel that having been part of the development uh, space for a long time, we have been making that case for decades. And we have got nothing. So I think the case should be made, should be doubled, but we should also look at what are the ways in which we can deliver something. I think that if we create a symmetrical international financial system, uh, that is actually revolutionary as well. The asymmetry of the, of, the, of the system, the extractive nature of it, the colonial nature of it, safe versus risky, the colonial nature of that. If we change that and make the system symmetrical, that's revolutionary as well. So I think we have the revolutionary things we can do and achieve in five years, whilst uh, you work with others to lay down the longer term revolution. <laughs> okay. uh, thanks for your comments. I, I, I guess I'm, I'm nobody's opposed to the issuance of more SDRs, I would believe, maybe except for the US Treasury. Um, can you hear me? Do you want me to speak louder? OK, I'll speak. I, I can hear you, yeah. OK, great. I mean, I never need an excuse to speak louder. <laughs> but. Um, I, I think I think there's a mischaracterization of the problem because I feel the the fact that most countries that rely on SDR issuance actually are the ones that often get them the least and their quota is the least is actually a symptom of the fact that the current system is inherently an asymmetric one. In fact, the symmetrical role of SDRs in a way only operates in sort of the mythical Keynesian ICU system that we do not have today. Um, and also, just to give you an example in terms of the practical challenges, even if you want to be practical about sort of an automatic issuance of SDRs, uh, say, with a climate lever, um, for, for a time I was working uh, actually with, with uh, in Mariana Nazgato's Council of ha has ha with 
Council on the Economics of Health for All for designing, thinking about rethinking economics after the pandemic. Um, and there were some discussions around uh, perhaps doing something related to creating a famine trigger in terms of like if there is risk of famine somewhere in the world, perhaps we can uh, you know, release some kind of funds, SDRs, etc. And that was basically like a non-starter with anybody who was sort of in the financial world. Because uh, they were like, oh, but who's going to decide when there's a famine trigger, even though the internationally agreed organizations have uh, very clear stages of famine. And it was an entirely a non-starter for something as, which is absolutely an indicator of the climate crisis, uh, food, food insecurity and famine in all, large parts of the world. So the only people who the IMF would accept as the arbiters of when there is a climate emergency is themselves. And there's no incentive for them I think, I mean, this is my reading of uh, all history of IMF so far, um, that they, I, I doubt that they would accept any kind of automatic trigger. And even when they do, the countries that need it the, need it the most, they're not going to be the ones that get it. Uh, it's going to be the United States. <laughs> so I feel like it's a fundamentally asymmetric system, and therefore to make it more symmetric means moving away from the SDRs or something more concrete. So I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Sorry so, for being extra so if loud. All we do is, yeah. If all we do is issue more SDRs, absolutely correct. The SDR allocations are essentially based around GDP. So the richest countries take the greatest amount. The smallest countries, the poorest countries, have, have the least amount. But that is why uh, what has been happening for the last couple of years uh, is very important, which is a rechanneling of surplus SDRs. Uh, firstly, developing countries have used their SDRs. 80% of the new issuance of SDRs by African and Caribbean and, and uh, uh, Latin American countries uh, have, have been used. So this is a sign that we, this is something that was of benefit to developing countries, and we need to do more of it. But the rechanneling of SDRs will be very important, and there's been a rechanneling of uh, around 100 billion. Uh, Which is voluntary. Some uh, agreement. Yes, voluntary reach out to the where, where there has been uh, some movement, has been that they can be rechanneled to uh, multilateral development right? so then uh, use, use them to then confessional finance uh, to, to develop income. So I think that will be a way to, of, of trying to make the issues of SDRs more supportive. But you know, if, even if we did not do that, I strongly believe. Mm -hmm should do that. Actually, even with the unequal issuance of SDR, it is those more SDRs uh, get used by developing countries. 